Look, I don't want to be mean. I don't want to settle for cheap or easy opinions here on this channel. Um, but the more I listened to Roger Waters' October 6th release, call, which he's calling Dark Side of the Moon Redux, um, the more I felt as if I was doing so so that you didn't have to. Um, it pains me to say this about Roger, uh, someone whose solo career I've loved. Certainly, I've been a big Pink Floyd fan throughout my life, but um, we'll talk about the magic moments in Roger's solo career that preceded this this uh, dull, lifeless, and, and pointless e experiment um, uh, of a project in a, a, what he's calling a redux of Dark Side of the Moon. Released in 1973, so 2023, this is the 50th anniversary of it. That's his kind of thin justification for having re-recorded the record, um, but having done so with so much more verbiage just, just dumped onto the original songs, all of which are, are spoken in this spoken word manner, very little of which makes any sense or seems to have any place within a Dark Side of the Moon context whatsoever. There are points on this record when Roger Waters just sort of seems to be interviewing himself and rambling on about personal scenes from his life, um, recent and past. Um, there's some rambling stuff about on, on the run. Um, uh, a battle between good and evil that you don't even know what he's talking about. Again, how is this something that is sensible within a Dark Side of the Moon context? Um, in what way is this, as Roger is putting it, um, progressing the work of the original record was one of his stated ambitions um, when he announced Dark Side of the Moon Redux. He also said he didn't want to supersede or replace the original. Well, that's pretty apparent pretty quickly on this record. Um, but also, it's it's just it's it's a maybe some a hilarious indication of the the magnitude of Roger's ego that he he would think anyone would believe him. Um, you know, again, egotistical enough to assume that he could in any way supersede or replace the majesty of that 1973 Pink Floyd release, Dark Side of the Moon. Um, you know, and it's 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 a shame in in multiple respects, but in 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 this one way, importantly, Roger Waters' solo career has had plenty of magical moments. Um, it really is for Pink Floyd fans worth spending time with. It has been at least up until now. Um, Tim Pierce, for example, tells a great story of playing on a Roger Waters record called "Amused to Death" in 1992. That album has this killer rocker on there called um, uh, What God Wants. None other than Jeff Beck. May his soul continue to rest in peace. We lost Jeff, uh, one of the most brilliant guitarists who ever, ever touched the instrument earlier this year. He plays lead guitar on that record. And, and I'm telling you, it's a lot to say that anything Roger's done since Pink Floyd rivals any of the work he did with David Gilmour. But that's a track. It may be the only track in, in Roger's canon that can withstand such, such lofty praise. But Jeff Beck, according to Tim Pierce, I'll, I'll link to this video in the description, had just purchased the guitar he used on that record, brings it into the studio. He, he's just getting to know this, this particular guitar. And Tim Pierce, who, who is a guy who's played with Bon Jovi, Belinda Carlisle, John Waite, Rick Springfield, Kenny Loggins, Michael Jackson, Tina Turner, Rod Stewart, Bruce Springsteen, Meatloaf, his jaw drops watching Jeff Beck do what he does on that record. Um, uh, well, that that uh, that song, "What God Wants," is just brilliant, and it's brilliant in no small part because of Jeff Beck's contribution as the lead guitar player. Roger's lyrics are as biting as ever on that on that song, but it's really not just about Roger's words here. It's uh, just as it was with Pink Floyd. It's about the music too, and specifically the music of a brilliant guitar player. And in this case. Uh, Jeff Beck's brilliant guitar playing. So if you're a Pink Floyd fan who hasn't spent a lot of time with Roger Waters' solo work, Dark Side of the Moon Redux is not going to give you a reason to do that. Uh, Amused to Death might. What God Wants, thanks to Jeff Beck, is incredible. Uh, there's another wonderful little ballad on there, acoustic ballad called uh, Watching TV, that is probably one of the finest acoustic pieces Roger's ever penned. 
I also loved 1987's Radio Waves. The production is terribly outdated, but there's a gorgeous ballad on there that I would put up against just about any uh, beautiful ballad that, that Roger was a part of in Pink Floyd days. It's called uh, The Tide is Turning. It's gorgeous. Uh, there's a nice little rocker on there called Who Needs Information. Listen, Roger, you know, he's been making good music since Pink Floyd. Um, but more recently, he took almost two decades off from cutting. He had a classical uh, record in there around, uh, uh, forget what, well, might have been 2015 or something like that. But 2017, he comes out with his, his Since Amuse to Death. This was, so 1992 to 2017, there was really nothing. Uh, in terms of a Roger Waters rock record, right? In 2017, he comes out with, um, is this the life we really want? It's as good a solo record as one could could imagine getting from Roger Waters. It's consistent from first song to last. Uh, there's a killer lead single on there called Smell the Roses. It's just fantastic. Um, so there's a lot of precedent for, for greatness uh, from Roger Waters as a, as a solo artist. And that's why at age 80 in 2023, this record from him falls so flat in, in such a shocking way because the precedent, again, of, of Roger's solo work is, is in parts extraordinary. Um, there was also a lot of, of reason to, to feel hopeful about how this was going to turn out because a lot of the, the musicians that he played with on Is This a Life We Really Want return for this record. In particular, I want to point to the drummer, Joey Warren Warrenker, who listen to the, the the bands that Joey has played with. The Who, Beck, R.E.M., Smashing Pumpkins. He played on their Adore record. Tom York, David Byrne, Wolfmother, Neil Diamond, Adele, Tracy Chapman, Tegan and Sarah, Nora Jones, Dwight Yoakam, Nelly Furtado, Pink, Richard Thompson. One of the greatest guitarists who ever lived. Uh, top 10, probably, gu guitar player, I, I would say. Poo-poo what I just said all you want. Go and listen to some Richard Thompson, okay? Uh, he is incredible. And, and this guy played with him. He played with Paul McCartney, Elliot Smith. Um, so these are not out-of-touch musicians. Joey is as in-demand a drummer as the business has today, okay? Um, so to the extent that this album, and it does, sounds hushed and somber and dour and morbid, um, it's almost as if the music is an afterthought here. It's not Joey's fault. It's not the band's fault. Uh, evidently, that was the vision that Roger had for, for this. Um, and it just, it just leaves one wondering what the point was. Now, the record does get off to a kind of a, a vaguely interesting start when Roger, it turns out, begins not with original lyrics from Dark Side of the Moon, but Speak to Me begins with Roger reciting the lyrics to a song from the album that came out uh, before Dark Side of the Moon. Do you know the name of that record? I'll give you a second. 1972 is Obscured by Clouds. Again, if you're a Pink Floyd fan who hasn't really listened to much from um, before Pink Floyd became the Pink Floyd that they are known to be today with records like 1973's Dark Side of the Moon, 1975's Wish You Were Here, 1977's Animals, 1979's The Wall, Obscured by Clouds, there is every reason to listen to that record, okay? There's a song on it called Free Four, that, the lyrics of which Roger recites right at the start of, of Dark Side of the Moon Redux. The lyrics have always been wonderful, but it's just a killer song. Um, Obscured by Clouds was maybe the last record on which you could really hear all four guys making their individual contributions to the record. It, it was maybe the last record that they recorded before Roger's influence over the band um, started to become increasingly tyrannical. All the songs were his. Um, many of the vocals were, were his or, or him and David singing together. Uh, but on Obscure by Clouds, you've gets, you get a song called Stay by Rick Wright that is gorgeous. It's a show-stopping piano, dreamy piano ballad. Um, beautiful. You get uh, a, a nice little rocker called The Gold where David Gilmour is killing it on guitar and his singing throughout this record is wonderful as well. Um, there's another um, really nice rocker on there, the, the title which is escaping me, um, Childhood's End which has always been one of my favorite Pink Floyd record uh, songs. That's on Obscure by Clouds. So it's actually really cool 
To hear Roger Waters at age 80 in 2023 revisiting this 51-year-old album that he recorded when he was basically a kid, um, it, you know, so it, it's interesting in that way, but it's like, okay, this is cool. It's free for from 1972's Obscured by Clouds, the, the album that came out immediately prior to Dark Side of the Moon. But why? Like, what? What am I? What connection am I supposed to be drawing other than that rather obvious one? Yes, okay, that's the album that came out before Dark Side of the Moon. What is it in the lyrics? The memories of a man in his old age are the deeds of a man in his prime, um, which is the first the, the 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 first line of the song. Have to do with the Dark Side of the Moon context. What is this connection that Roger is just is seemingly expecting us to make? Um, it's it, it's it's not apparent, and it kind of just gets worse from there um, in terms of trying to understand what the objective is here. What is he trying to accomplish with Dark Side of the Moon Redux? I found this really nice uh, review that I think captures this quandary perfectly. It was at uh, Ultimate Classic Rock. Okay, I'll, I'll link to this album review in the description. It says this, the worst offenses on Dark Side of the Moon Redux are committed upon Great Gig in the Sky, which plumbs some of the original album's deepest emotional places without the benefits of any lyrics at all. Not here. It's just another track operating in the hushed service of soliloquy after soliloquy. That's just true, okay? Um, Redux almost stirs awake for Waters' withering criticism of greed on money, but the original's pulse-quickening menace remains well outside this LP's grasp, indeed. Soon, Rot Waters is talking again, yet somehow not saying much. Uh, this is especially apparent with what Roger does here with On the Run, where uh, he starts talking about uh, some uh, battle between good and evil that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. The language is weird. He, at one point, seems very proud of himself for using an abstruse word like Patmosian, and he says... Um, whatever that means, but that's evidently another story. And you're thinking, well, if you don't know what that thousand dollar word means, Roger, why are you using it? Um, what is your point? This is where it's, it gets to the point uh, where you're wondering, what is going on here? Like, what's the point of all of this? Why do I need to listen? In why does this... Here's the thing. If you want to hear Dark Side of the Moon, why would anyone go to Roger's Redux from 2023 versus the original record. Uh, maybe that was always going to be the problem with with uh, such a, a, I don't know, an, a, a, an egotistical project as, hey, let's re-record the greatest album I ever made at age 80 without anyone else from the band. David has nothing to do with this, nor does Nick Mason. Rick Wright, of course, has been dead uh, for some time now. Uh, but that's the kind of the question that Ro Roger makes himself vulnerable to here, isn't it? Um, why this rather than the original? Um, so, you know, with with On the Run, you get that, that weirdness. He, he ends up, once he gets through this odd spoken word thing, um, he starts actually singing lyrics again. And you realize at this point that what Roger's approach to this record was is, I'm going to have these spoken word pieces that will comprise entirely my own new writing. And then I'll, okay, fine, I'll sing in this sort of bored, hushed, whispery tone the lyrics of the original songs. That's generally what he does throughout this record. He will begin with spoken word ramblings, leaving you wondering, what, where is this going? And then, boom, song hits this wall where it's like, okay, it's time to actually acknowledge that this was a song on the original record, and let's go ahead and, I don't know, take a stab at singing it. But Roger uh, sounds more like Leonard Cohen when he's singing these songs than he does uh, even as recently as on 2017's um, uh, uh, album with songs like Smell the Roses. He was singing his butt off on that record. I mean, the vocals are tremendous. Uh, throughout that album, but here they're again they're they the the singing is an afterthought. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, he's he's he gets to great gig in the sky as as ultimate classic rock uh, alludes, and there's a tender, touching story here. I mean, I have to admit, I you know I'm probably one of the weirdos for whom uh, 
a story about his apparently friend Donald Hall, who was an American poet who died at age 89 in 2018, won the National Book Critic Circle Award for uh, a book-length collection called The One Day. See, this is the thing. I've got the book because, um, you know, Roger's talking about how he communicated with, with Donald Hall at a time when Donald Hall was dying of cancer. And his assistant, someone apparently named Kendall, who uh, Roger reveals on this great gig in the sky thing that he does, um, told him, look, you know, Donald really isn't going to be in a position to talk. Um, you know, he's he's basically dying. And so Roger tells this kind of touching story of his back and forth with the assistant to this American poet. Who, what, what Pink Floyd fan is necessarily, or Roger Waters fan for that matter, going to be aware of who Donald Hall was. That's not their fault. I mean, Donald Hall, you know, who who's reading who's reading how many people are reading America? I mean, I in 2003 I communicated with Don, I reached out to Donald Hall. So, you know, I, I was a, a master a masters of fine writing um, uh, student in, in the creative writing program at the New School. Donald Hall's best friend, Lee, one of his best friends, Liam Rector, was a seminar instructor of mine, and I couldn't get my hands on this this book length collection he came out with in uh, 1988, for which he won the National Book Critics Circle Award, which is a huge award for for a poet to win. So he reaches out to Donald, and Donald sends me a signed copy of this book with uh, a very nice letter. Here it is. It's I don't know if you can see it. To John Mark Manzione, that's me, February 1st, 2003. So, look, I'm as receptive an audience to this kind of a stuff as anyone, Roger. I know damn well who Donald Hall was. I've read lots of his stuff. His, his 1995 collection, Without, which he wrote after losing his wife, another talented poet named Jane Kenyon, who also died of cancer, is, is an incredible book. Uh, heartbreaking s stuff as he grieves the loss of, of Jane Kenyon, who meant so much to him um, later in his life. But the problem, Roger, is what does this have to do with Dark Side of the Moon? This is where he just sounds like he's interviewing himself. Just, I don't know, I'll just ask myself what I'm interested in talking about today. And then what I'll do is, because I'm aware that some of this stuff, at least, might come off as kind of boring to the, the average listener. I mean, it's intriguing to me, this Donald Hall story, but most listeners... I, you, I have found reviews where people are saying, who the hell is Donald Hall and why should I care? And they're right. I, you know, I get it. If, if, if Donald isn't someone who, you know, you've, you've had an a, a affection for uh, as, a, as a creative writing student in grad school 20 years ago, it's not going to resonate with you. Um, and that's not anyone's fault. Um, it's just, it, it, it's an inevitable result of these rambling tales that Roger tells. What does this have to do with, with Dark Side of the Moon? Um, it, it's as if Roger thought, like I was saying, you know, if if some of this comes off as boring to the average listener, why don't I do this to, to get it listened to? Why don't I slap it onto uh, the, the most famous record I've ever been a part of, Dark Side of the Moon, 50 years ago? And then they'll be, they'll, they'll have no choice but to listen to what it is I want to muse about on Great Gig in the Sky, or it could have been on any other track. It could have been on any other Roger Waters record. Roger, make a spoken word album. Just do that. Hardly anyone's going to have an interest in listening to it, but but it, that's what you're interested in doing here at this point in your life, and that's fine, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, <laughs> but then he gets to money, and he kind of sings this the song with this gruff, weathered whisper, again, sounding like Leonard Cohen, and you're just sort of thinking... I just don't know. This sounds pointless. This sounds lifeless. This sounds dull. I don't hear any urgency here that justifies revisiting this this inordinately famous record for whether it's a 50th anniversary or not. What is this? Why, why was this needed? Um, by the time you get to Eclipse, it, he he doesn't even like sing uh, at that point. He just sort of talks his way to the end of the record. Um, you get some an interesting string arrangement on his version of Us and Them here that's vaguely reminiscent to my ear, at least, of Eleanor Rigby, though in no way does it rival that because that is one of the most uh, breathtaking pieces of music ever, ever conceived. But, you know, you sort of hear some vague Beatles influence here. I believe he did record this at Abbey Road, so it makes sense, right? But I think the bottom line with Dark Side of the Moon Redux 
was captured quite well by Stephen Thomas Erlewin over at allmusic.com. He said this, um, Roger has turned Dark Side of the Moon into a voyage inward, not outward. Exactly. Because it, it, it's almost as if Roger has decided that he's bigger than Dark Side of the Moon. Um, you know, he, he's, he's more important than this larger to life record. But what the album does most successfully, unfortunately for Roger, is it documents just how sorely mistaken about that he is. Um, so, as always, come to your own conclusions about this record. Um, my experience with this record is one of utter bewilderment. I don't understand why it exists. I don't understand. I don't hear any any of the urgency that would justify uh, a, such a grand project as revisiting an album as 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 just massively successful critically, commercially, and, and in every conceivable way, as Dark Side of the Moon was for Pink Floyd in 1973. It turned them into gods, um, and it, unfortunately, it, it seems as if. Uh, Roger believes himself uh, to be, uh, I don't know, the, the a, a, some overarching divinity who um, is is bigger than this larger than life record, as I said, and yeah, unfortunately it proves him rather disastrously mistaken in that regard. Uh, give it a listen yourself, see what you think, uh, but if you struggle too, don't tell me I didn't warn you. <laughs> 